Well, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. So here's a question for you today. Are you known by God? Are you known by God? You can ask yourself that today. Does God know me? And what does that mean? So today we're going to be going back into our series in Genesis. We're going to see the first example in the Bible of this kind of relational knowledge, a knowledge that is reflected throughout the rest of the Bible, throughout the rest of God's revelation. Whenever we see the word know, we should be thinking in these terms, a knowledge, an understanding of what it means to be known by God. And here's a hint. It actually goes quite far beyond what we mean in English when we say No, I know that person. Last time we were in Genesis, we saw what happened when Adam and Eve were thrown out of the Garden of Eden. And the way back to paradise was guarded. The the way back was kept by an insurmountable enemy, a foe, a guardian. Without dealing with that sin, with our sin problem, we'd never be able to make it back into his presence. Praise be to God that through the Lord Jesus Christ, He has opened up a way of access so we can boldly go before his throne of grace and find grace in times of need. So today we'll consider from chapter 4 what it means to be known by God. So let's read it together. Chapter 4 verse 1. Now the man knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. What does it mean to know somebody? It says Adam knew his wife. When uh, the Bible uses language of knowing and being known, what does it mean? Because obviously we don't talk about that in English in that way, do we? And can you say of yourself, I am known by God? Obviously, when I ask that question, I'm not saying, does God know of your existence? Of course, God knows that you exist. He created you. He formed you in his image. He planned your every day here on earth. He made you in his image so that you would bring glory to him. That's uh, not the kind of knowledge I'm talking about. The knowledge that we're talking about today is a special kind of knowledge that involves relationship. It involves love and choice. So my question is, are you known by God? It says that Adam knew his wife. Now, did Adam know Eve before this event? Of course he did. He knew, about, he knew her, right? The knowledge that we're talking about here is specifically an intimate, relational kind of knowledge. Again, we don't use that word in English, do we, like that? It's actually a physical kind of knowledge here that resulted in Eve conceiving her first child. But when we see the word know in scripture, it is often used quite differently to the way we use it in English, especially when it talks about God knowing us. There's much greater intimacy to that, to that a level of intimacy to that word. So Adam knew Eve in intimacy, but God knows you even more deeply than you know yourself. In the Bible, you'll you'll see sometimes The people will call out to God, knowing that God knows them more than they know themselves. And they'll call out to God and say, God, give me that knowledge that I don't even have. You can think about, for example, Psalm 139 is a very good example because it's a well-known psalm. It talks about God's knowledge of us, right? Starts off, uh, celebrates the fact that God, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit up, sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. See, it's astounding to think that God knows so much about us. This knowledge is too high for us. God searches our hearts 
He knows all of our thoughts. We talk about God being omniscient, right? Kids, you heard that word before? God is omniscient. He is omnipresent. And he is, what's the other one? Om omnipotent. Good. Heard someone. Yep. So God is all-knowing. He's all-powerful, right? When we talk about God knowing, he knows all of our thoughts. And often when we say we talk about God's omniscience, his all-knowingness, we, we usually refer to like the physical universe, right? He knows everything about everywhere. So if you think about the book of Job, for example, at the end of the book of Job, chapters uh, 38 to 41, God gives us a small glimpse of his omniscience, his all-encompassing, sovereign understanding. He, uh, he actually takes Job on a bit of a... Uh, he, he goes through a list of uh, what he knows that Job hasn't got the first idea about, the first inkling of. So God tells him about the beginning of creation. Were you there, Job, when I did this and I set the boundaries for the sea and formed the earth? He tells him about the, the glorious beauty of the clouds and how rain comes down and snow and hail. He tells Job about the paths of the constellations, the, the paths that the stars take in the sky and the behavior of animals that are reclusive and you don't normally know about, you don't see. Jo God talks to Job about that. So obviously God has all knowledge of everything in the physical universe because he's omnipresent, right? He's, he exists everywhere, so he sees everything, so he knows everything. So he can tell you about every individual ant in your garden, what, it, what it's doing at all times of the day and night. But when we're talking about God's knowledge, it goes even deeper than that. It goes deeper still. It extends to an absolute knowledge of our own hearts, our own thoughts. God knows your heart. He knows all of your thoughts. He knows everything you've said and done and thought and everything you will think and say and do. There's nothing you can hide from God. Did everybody hear me? There's nothing you can hide from God. Kids, there is nothing you can hide from God. He knows you much better than you know yourself. So David says God knows him fully, the thoughts of his heart from afar. God knows my thoughts from afar in advance. God knows David's paths, what he's going to choose to do or say or think. This absolute knowledge, it's overwhelming for us to think about. And at the end of the psalm, David makes a prayer. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. See, David's asking God to show him things in his own heart that he doesn't know about. God, is there a grievous thought in here? Am I sinning against you somewhere in my heart? Show me. Lead me the right way, God, because you know me. You truly know me. We should make this our own prayer as well. We know that God knows all things, right? He knows us better than we know ourselves. So we should be asking him, God, show me. Is there a grievous way in me? Is there a way of a sin occurring in my heart? Please lead me in the right way. This is the right way to think about our self-knowledge. That's why in the Bible you see great men of God following this pattern and asking God to expose in their own hearts where there's darkness that we didn't even know about. David, again, David in Psalm 19, he says this, Who can discern his errors? We, we have a difficulty in even understanding about our own sinfulness, about our own error sometimes. We, we're very very conveniently have these blinders that blind ourselves to our own sin. So David says, declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So in this psalm, David is acknowledging some of his own faults in his heart, and they're hidden even to him, but God knows, because God knows him. 
He even asks God, please direct my thoughts and my meditation in my heart. Direct it along the right way. And that's how well God knows us and what he can do in our hearts too. So we should be asking God, God, you know me. Please direct, lead my heart. The prophets also speak of this knowledge of God. In fact, Jeremiah is a, a prophet who's worth reading. You'll see it come up time and time again in Jeremiah about God's knowledge of him. He said, you, O Lord, know me. You see me and you test my heart toward you. So for Jeremiah, God's knowledge of his heart was also a testing of his heart. What is my heart like towards you, God? You know me and you test my heart. God knows us and tests our heart and we cannot hide our motivations from him. They're, they're laid out like an open book before him. Like I said, kids, we can't hide anything from God. We're like an open book to him. And he's testing our hearts before him. God told Jeremiah about this, this knowledge that he has of him. Even before Jeremiah existed. In our chapter 1, God said this to Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before. You see, before he existed, God says, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I chose you. I set you apart. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. See, God knows everything about every child in every womb. Right? God has that knowledge. But when he spoke to Jeremiah, he said, I knew you. And for Jeremiah, that knowledge included God's personal choice of Jeremiah. <coughs> his setting apart of Jeremiah to be prophet to the nations. So when we, when we consider God's knowledge of us, what it means for him to know us, we see this biblical flavor here of the word know that includes more than just a head knowledge. It's more than that. It's a choice and it's love. God goes on to tell Jeremiah that when it comes to knowing him, when it comes to us knowing God, that ought to be our boast more so than anything else. Chapter 9. Let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. See, our boast should not be in ourselves, but the fact that we know God. And that we are known by God. Our boast should be in His grace and mercy alone, not in our own abilities. It's actually the most important fact about our life, is to say, do you know God? That's, that's the most important question there is. And the answer is the most important thing about your life. Do you know God? Are you known by God? It's this understanding about God knowing us that's the key to our sanctification as well. Kids, do you know what sanctification means? I'm sure there's some in here who might not know. Sanctification is talking about when God is making us holy, making us like him, working in our hearts, working in our lives. To, to live in a way that pleases him. So listen how Paul here links our sanctification with knowledge of God. It's in Galatians 4. Formerly, Galatians 4. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you've come to know God, or rather, to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? That's the question. Now that you've come to know God or rather be known by God, how can you go back to sin? See, there's a purifying power that God works in our lives when we realize that God has intimately known us. He has chosen us. He has set his love on us. And his knowledge of us includes every hair of our head, right? He said, every hair of your head is numbered. But it goes beyond that mere understanding knowledge to a love. 
a, a relational knowledge, a choice, just like Adam knew his wife Eve. So in Christ, you are the object of God's love. You are the object of his choice. You're the apple of his eye. That's what the Bible says about the people of God. We are the apple of his eye. And he's known you from before you were born. Before he created the world, he knew you. It's a beautiful truth to, to recognize. When we say that God knows us, we're saying he loves us. So God doesn't just know all there is to, is to know about us. He's actually loved us through his love and his choice. He's known us in love and in choice. Just like he loved Jeremiah. He knew Jeremiah. That's what the New Testament also applies to us. Romans 8 verse 29 is sometimes misunderstood. It says, those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. See, God didn't just know about us. He knew, he, he knew about everybody, right? We could say about the entire world, God knew about them beforehand. It doesn't say that God knew beforehand what you would do. It says he knew you beforehand. He foreknew us. And everybody he foreknew before the foundation of the world in Christ he chose. He chose us in love and he predestined us to be conformed to the image of Christ. You can say that God knows all people. But when it comes to his elect, we say he especially knew us, foreknew us in love. He chose us. He initiated relationship with us. Just like Jesus said, you did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. So much of the, the, in the writings of the New Testament, we see the apostles grappling with this amazing truth, this deep truth that God has known us beforehand. It's very hard to express in human language, but they do try. Uh, Paul had another go in the first section of his letter to the Ephesians. He said uh, in chapter one, even as he, God chose us in Christ, he chose us in him. Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. Praise the Lord for him foreknowing us and setting his love on us, his predestining love to adopt us as his children, according to his foreknowledge. See, that's why foreknown can't mean that he knew about us beforehand. He can't, it can't mean simply that he knew about what would happen. He knows about everything that will happen, of course. When we talk about God's foreknowledge, his knowledge of people, we're talking about intimate, relational knowledge. We're talking about active knowledge, not, not passive knowledge where he's just learning something. We're talking about him knowing his people. He knew you. He chose you. He predestined you in Christ to salvation. He didn't foreknow what you would do. He foreknew you. That's the point here. This is a revelation of the glorious truth that before the foundation of the world, God set his love on us in Christ. We, the people of God, are precious to him. We're the apple of his eye. In uh, Isaiah 49, when God was talking to about how his people are going to be looked after, no longer hunger or thirst or no scorching wind or sun would strike them. He said that the, he would comfort us and have compassion on us. He says in Isaiah 49, verse 15 and 16, I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. That's how much God loves us in Christ. Isn't that amazing to think? Your name is written on the hands of God. You are always before him. That's how much he loves you. It's like the song, my name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. We're going to sing that at the end, aren't we? It's glorious to know that the God of the entire universe has shown this amazing love to me. 
You can say that for yourself. God has loved me. There's a, a Puritan writer called Richard Baxter. When he was, uh, he was considering this truth, he said, To be known by God is the full and final comfort of a believer. When it all comes down to it, when it all gets stripped away, when everything else is gone, when all have turned against you, that's what I can cling to. I am known by God. God loves me. He holds my future in his hands. So we can trust him and follow him because he knows us. Jesus said, uh, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. In fact, it's all over the Bible. As you, as you look, especially in the New Testament, this, this idea of God knowing us and us knowing God is the foundation for our Christian lives. As Christians, we're called to love God because if anyone loves God, he is known by God. It's 1 Corinthians 8 verse 3. If we are to, to love God, it's because we are first known by God. We're called to love one another because that proves our knowledge of God. 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. See how that connection there of the knowledge of God and our knowledge of him and our love for one another. And ultimately, we're promised that our knowledge of God will catch up to where it should be. In the end, we will know God fully just as he knows us now. Where do we learn that? In 1 Corinthians 13, that famous chapter, the love chapter, right? Right at the end there, it says... Now we see in a mirror dimly. Back then, the mirrors that they had were just kind of like made of bronze. And it was hard. It was actually quite hard to see yourself in the reflection. So it's kind of like a dim reflection. Right now, that's how we see, he says. But then, face to face. When we, when we see God in glory, when we enter those heavenly gates, when we go before him, then we will see God face to face. Now I know in part then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. As God has fully known me here on earth, when I go to those, those gates of glory before him, then I shall know fully. All of this biblical teaching hangs on our understanding of the word know as we've seen it in Genesis 4. It means more, more than we see in in English, more than the English word no. It's deeper, it's fuller. Adam knew his wife, she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. See, there's something that Eve came to know as well here. Eve knew as she brought forth Cain with the Lord's help, she knew something. In fact, the sentence seems to be conveying some kind of optimism that. I mean, what, what, what had just happened to Eve, Adam and Eve? The last interaction they had with God, what was it? It was cursing and banishment, right? And then the very next verse here, a couple of verses later, she says, she gives birth to the child in the act of creation, as it were. She knows that the true creator, the Lord, has helped her to give birth. She knows that God is with her. She is known by God, for God is her help and salvation. So how can we conclude today? Well, we shouldn't be afraid as we face trials here on earth, because we are known by God. You are known by God. He has set his love on you. He has chosen you. He is intimately involved in every detail of your life. Again, kids can't hide anything from God. And he is always with you. Jesus said, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. God takes pleasure in knowing you and in giving you his kingdom. And therefore, we should not be afraid because the almighty, omnipotent, omniscient king of the universe is on our side. I want to finish here with a, uh, a summary of this biblical theme. It's written by David Furman. 
He's an American uh, theologian. Hurting friend. Don't look for your ultimate comfort in things in this world. Some of these things are good things, and they're often a help to us, but one day, even the good things will fail you. Don't look for comfort in your social media activity. Let that one land on us, eh? Don't look for comfort in your social media activity or your hobbies. Don't search for it among your friends from work or in your boss's applause. You are known by the king. He knows your name and everything about you. He sees all of your pain. May this be true for us as we think about the fact that God knows us and loves us and gave his one and only son for us that all who believe in him will not perish, will not die, but have everlasting life. You are his creation and he knows you and he wants you to know him. He's calling you to himself. Do you know God? Are you known by him? Please trust in him today. And may the Lord be pleased to bless us all to trust in him and bless our meditation on his word this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your grace and kindness, Lord. We thank you that you know us, Lord. You have foreknown us. You have chosen us and set your love on us. We thank you for this intimate, Lord, instigation, Lord, that you have begun. You initiated this relationship with us. I pray for each one of us, Lord, in this room, that we would have an, a relationship with you, Lord, that we would know you, that we would be known by you. Please help us all to turn to you in our hearts, Father. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.